morning, everybody. Happy Monday. <laughs> um, back in 1848, the first convention to discuss the rights of women was held. It was attended by 68 women and 32 men. 165 years later, we now have the right to vote as women. We have Roe versus Wade, and we have a president that realizes discrimination in health care is wrong. In 2014, the Affordable Care Act will implement something long overdue, and that's the clause to ensure that there is no discrimination based on gender in health care. We've come a long way, baby, right? <laughs> there have no doubt. But in 2009, our president signed the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which addresses how and when a woman may file a lawsuit for wage discrimination. I, too, have passed the clause around the Senate side, along with Representative Gallegos, uh, Senate Bill 402, and the Fair Pay for Women Act. And this bill in particular says that no employer shall discriminate within any of the establishment between employees on the basis of sex by paying wages to employees in the establishment at a race at a rate less than the rate that the employer pays wages to employees of the opposite sex for equal work on jobs and the performance of this requires equal skill, effort, and responsibility that are performed under similar working conditions. We are here highlighting this bill today, along with the minimum wage increase bills, because these are issues that are important to us as Democrats. Our theme today is social justice. And as a woman, a single parent, as many that there are in our communities, providing services to women that are in need or underserved by many communities here in our state, this is part of the social justice that we have to continue working to eradicate all the bad things that continue to help. There are bills that I am sponsoring that relate to social justice, and they are also in a handout that you have received, and I just want to highlight a few of them. One is Senate Bill 43 that requires health services for pregnant women. Senate Bill 45 to prevent births among adolescents, which is a big issue in our state and how we address those issues. Senate Bill 46 and 74, sexual assault prevention services. Senate Bill 49, children, youth, and families department statewide domestic violence programs. Senate Bill 381, which is adult basic education, funding, and tests. Senate Bill 382, excuse school absences for pregnancy. And there's also Senate Bill 92, no privacy, no pricing difference based on gender. What's at, we here as the legislature have to continue to be diligent to protect our rights, the rights of our citizens, and always have their best interests in mind. This is the social justice conversation that we have begun and will continue to have in this legislature. Because those that we represent are the ones who don't have a voice. And that is something I know that we as Democrats always support. And especially with regards to how our, all of the legislation and all our laws affect our families. That is the crux of everything that we do. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce We just uh, wanted uh, to say that, uh, as you can relate back to what we've been talking about, that uh, the Mexicans want us to work on jobs, but we understand social justice is a big part of that. A fair state is a welcoming state, and people will come and work here, and they'll, they'll enjoy it. So I want to thank uh, Senator, uh, President Pro Tem, Mary Kay Papen, uh, helping that. We also wanted to say that, as you can see, social justice relates back to jobs. There's another component to, to jobs in New Mexico. That's having a well-educated youth, having a process of education, K through 12 and higher ed, that prepares our New Mexico citizens for the future and keeps them here uh, so that they don't have to go out of state to get the employment based upon their ability that they learned in our educational system. So next week, we're going to let you know. We're going to have a, a come together and talk to you about education. Okay, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. No, except that I'd like to echo what you're saying, and I think that is right when we're looking at education. Uh, I think our children are our biggest natural resource, and we need to make sure that they are educated, that they're educated properly, that they're be going to be able to find jobs in New Mexico instead of having to go to other states to find jobs, and that they're going to have the uh, wonderful equal pay, particularly women in the system. Uh, that we're going to be able to do those sorts of things for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you.
As you can see, uh, everyone's here, and they're coming in and out because we're in committee. This is important to us. Thank you for holding your questions to the end, and we'd be happy to take a few questions at this time if you have any. Question about the fair wage. What would you say to consumers who would worry that this just means the price of everything we buy is going up? I know um, the gentleman who had the burger restaurant said that he believes in fair wage for his employees, but um, can an employer like that guarantee to the consumers that the price of burgers and fries aren't going to be going up for the rest of the community? And Representative, you got you Santa Fe as an example. We have one of the highest minimum wages in the country. It's also the one of the, if not the most, high cost of living in the state to live. So, um, how how do you perhaps ease some of those concerns that people um, are worried about <coughs> prices will be for that? Yeah, the price of, of anything, including hamburgers, is is partially a cost of the production, which is minimum wage. Would perhaps say that it costs a little more, but we have an expert standing right behind you who makes burgers that's never paid a minimum wage. He has a wonderfully successful business. The other issue is, uh, and I think it's a better price point, is how many people are buying burgers. Uh, and if you can't buy a hamburger after working all day and take it home to your kids, then you're selling fewer burgers and the price goes up as, as a matter of fact. And I see, I see our expert from Real Burger behind me, uh, nodding his head, and I don't know if he'd like to add, or you, you'd, if you'd be well served to talk to him about that very specific question as soon as we bring it. Senator uh, Martinez or Sewell's, I don't know who would want to address this question. Uh, is your bill separate from Miguel's in that it doesn't include an automatic escalator each year, or does your bill also include uh, what he's trying to do through his constitutional amendment? Thank you. Uh, it is separate from the other bill, and at this point it does not include an es uh, escalator, I think is how you termed it. Uh, it's certainly something that we might look at through the committee process as to whether that might get added on using the cost of living index. But at this point, it is just to make a statewide $8.50 an hour minimum wage. And how did you settle on that number, $8.50? That, I believe, is what Albuquerque is currently has as their state or as their minimum wage, and I think that's appropriate statewide. Uh, that also is where some of the discussion nationally is, is that if to settle somewhere around 850, but nationally they're having a little trouble uh, talking to each other. And so we thought we ought to do that ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Would that depend on where you live, where you come from? Say, for example, in Santa Fe, it's the highest, so you have to pay people a little bit more. When you go to the outlining places like that, you can pay for the New Mexico, you can afford to pay some of those wages. That, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it was, uh, we talked about it in, in the press conference, across New Mexico, and I come from rural New Mexico, uh, prices are the same, if not higher. Uh, so for our rural residents, a lot of times, our price of gasoline, price of groceries, all those things are a little bit higher than the city because there's more of a competition. So you can imagine how uh, how painful that is on a family budget, not being able to, to feed your kids, having enough money to have at least some of the things, not just the necessities, but once in a while, like I said on the first day, maybe have enough money to take your kids uh, on a trip or something like that. Go fishing. But that's a great question. We have time for one more question and then we'll need a break. Yes. I'm an old business writer, and you know and I know that the business community is going to say <clears throat> you're squeezing the turn. We're struggling now, we can't afford it. What, what do you say to them? Well, I would say to them, look at uh, what's happened both in Santa Fe and now in Albuquerque. That's a pretty good indicator, uh, number one. And number two is uh, most businesses understand that you have some type of cost of living increase in everything you do, but when a minimum wage stays at the minimum without being touched by human hand, uh, by legislative hand, policy hand, for so many years, then you start getting upside down. And you're, you're actually, what you're doing is you're, hit, you're hurting the demand side of the economy where people would have money to come and purchase goods. It'll be good, good for business. It's, it, it's a moderate increase. And I don't know if Senator Sewell's or, or, or yes. Senator... If, if I may, uh, I actually did a bunch of research on this, and minimum wage is probably the most highly researched area of economics in the country. And all of the research 
has indicated that it is either positive for business or neutral. There is very little research studies that show any negative impact to the business community, either in the cost of services, uh, closing businesses. There's always that concern. The research indicates every time it's been raised, it just doesn't play out as being true. Thank, thank you. Yes. You know, just a little bit of the Santa Fe perspective on this, because we've been doing this experiment in a heavily service-based economy since the minimum wage was enacted in Santa Fe. Right now, the community that we're all in is experiencing the best job growth in the whole state. If Santa Fe were not part of the economy, our statewide job losses would be even worse. And we've had this growth and this expansion, this rising of the economic well-being of our people in spite of the minimum wage. I would say not, it's not in spite of it, it's because of it. And, and one final piece of, about the question about the, is this going to make hamburgers and french fries higher if we pass the Fair Pay Act for women? I would say if you're going and if someone is discriminating against women on purpose, is paying women less for the same job, and we fix that, and it means uh, a price of a hamburger and french fries goes up a nickel, it needs to go up a nickel. That's right. It's not right. It's not right that there are businesses, and we know that there are businesses, who are purposefully discriminating against women, and that needs to change as a matter of social justice, and that will improve the economy throughout for everybody who lives here. Can you just explain how, is there a loop in the federal laws that govern so the, fair yeah. food, fair So food? what this does is right now, and the best way I, I can think, think about it is if, if you're a woman working in a, a business in Raton, and you're being discriminated against on your wages because of your gender, right now the only way to bring a claim for that is in federal court. So you find a lawyer, file a claim in federal court, and by the luck of the draw, you might get assigned a judge in Las Cruces. Well, if you're earning $22,000 a year and you've got two kids, how in the world are you going to find justice driving to Las Cruces for every hearing? What this does is it allows the claim to be brought in state court. So that means you get justice closer to home. You can go to your Colfax County Courthouse. If, if you live in Rio Riva County, you go to Tierra Amarilla. Or in Farmington, you go to court there. It, it just brings the access to justice closer to home and makes meaningful improvements to the federal law to make it work better here for New Mexico. Th thank you, everybody, for joining us next week, Education. As you see, we have a deep bench. If you have any questions for any of the folks, I'm sure they're willing to stay.